I'm sure a number of people in the audience, uh, the males anyway, have had what we might call a midlife crisis, looking at their white picket fence or whatever might uh, be, be suitable parallel, and wondered if they, life should have taken a different path. Our speaker tonight, Russell, uh, uh, Russell Heath, has led that different path that some men might have wished they had considered. Eschewing convention, he hitchhiked to Alaska in his teens, lived in a cabin, went to Italy, crossed the Sahara and the jungles of Africa. He then sailed around the world in a wooden 25-foot boat with no engine or electronics, and apparently it started out not knowing how to sail. <laughs> the Explorers Club does not recommend that level of preparation. <laughs> he has worked on the last of pipeline, then apparently joined organizations trying to shut it down. Now leading a relatively conventional life in New York City, I had understood, although he tells me now he's moved to Maine, he's agreed to relate some of the details of his trip. Please welcome Russell Heath. So it's mid-afternoon, June, uh, August 6th. Right into the mic. Right into the mic. Mid-afternoon, August 6, 1985, Bob and I raised the sails on Kainui, and we sailed, <clears throat> we sailed slowly out of Elfin Cove in southwest Alaska. We're bound for the Gulf of Alaska. So we come out of the, <clears throat> come out of the cove, headed west, sky's gray, sea's flat. We're drifting along at maybe three or four knots, all sails up. In front of us are a series of islands Man, this is way too high tech for me. What's going on? Remember, you did not have this technology on the boat. I still don't have this technology in my life. So it's the coast of Alaska. So we're sailing towards a series of islands. On the other side of these islands is Cross Sound. And Cross Sound, oh, there's a backwards to it. There we go. There's Cross Sound. Cross Sound opens into the Gulf of Alaska. As we approach the islands, this big boat comes towards us. It's a fish, it's a fish buyer. And, <clears throat> and the skipper comes out on the deck, and he's got one of these big, aggressive guts. And he's going, go back, go back. But I didn't know what he was trying to say to me. I had no idea what he was trying to communicate. I think perhaps there's an uncharted rock in front of us. So I run into the bow, and I look, and I look, and I can't see a rock. So I look back at him, and he's going, go back, go back. <laughs> and then he passes us, and he goes, we keep on sailing. Now, some of you might suspect that my first day at sea isn't going to turn out well. <laughs> and I need to set the context here, and the context is this, is that I had been on a sailboat before, but I never had responsibility greater than just keeping out of the way. So we come out from behind these islands. We come out behind these islands, and we're slammed by this wall of wind and instantly swallowed by the fog. And Kainui has all her sails up, and she starts hobby-horsing over these big waves that are rolling in from the Pacific. Up, 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 and then falls down on the backside of these. I'm going to have trouble with this microphone here. Backside of these waves. And spray goes everywhere, and the rig's shaking back and forth. And I'd done a really close reading of Royce's Guide to Sailing, so I knew what to do. I, <clears throat> I yelled to Bob, Bob, we've got to take in a reef. And Bob's wedged into the cockpit. He's got the tiller under his arm. He's got the jib seat in one hand and the main sheet in another hand. He says, no, oh, I'm not leaving here. And I said, Bob, clear him off and come help me take in a reef. He says, no. And, you know, it's totally illusory, but that was the only control he had and he wasn't giving it up. So I go forward to the mast. You know, the boat's heaving over the waves. And I'm looking at all these, like, sailing things there and I'm saying, how do we take in this reef? And while I'm looking at it, Bob's yelling, we're on a lee shore. And for all of you, who read the Hornblower books and the, um, and the Aubrey books, you know you don't want to be on a lee shore. And I look downwind, and there's this big jagged rock sticking out of the water, and these house-high waves are obliterating themselves on it, and the sea is sucking and surging around. I mean, it was instant death. And I said, Bob, we've got to take in this reef. And, <clears throat> and I'm sitting there looking, and I'm starting to figure things out, and, and I need to 
That winter, I had taken the mast off the boat and stored it in a friend's basement. And I took all the hardware, I stripped all the hardware off of it, and then I sounded it down. It was a beautiful spruce rat. Oh, hang on, I got a really good picture here. There you go. And <clears throat> I sanded it, and I put 10 coats of varnish back on the mast. It just glistened. And then I put all the bits and pieces back on it, and I had two or three left over I didn't know what to do with, so I just threw them in my rigging bucket. But as I was staring at that, Mass, I, I figured out what they were for. So I go back and I drop below and get those pieces out of the rigging bucket. And I get a screwdriver and a pair of pliers and I turn to go back up. And I vomit. It <laughs> comes out of me and arcs all the way across the cabin and splatters on the wall. And my knees buckle and I stumble into the bulkhead. And then I climb I up the companion way and there's vomit coming down my chin. And I stagger back up there, and I do what I need to do to shorten sail. And as soon as the sail's off her kainui, oh, she's such a beautiful boat, she just glides over those big waves. And her skipper stumbles back to the cockpit, and I lie belly down, and my head's over the rail. And I'm heaving, and I'm retching, and I heave, and I heave. Long past there's anything to come up, just nothing but stomach lining and small intestine. <laughs> and... The two years that I've dreamed on this trip, dreamed of tropical isles, of coconut palms, of <laughs> beautiful lasses and grass skirts, it had never occurred to me, not once, that I might get seasick. <laughs> and I had no idea how miserable it was. And I said there, my head over the rail, and I knew it was a small boat, so half the time it was underwater. I said, no, I'm not putting up with this. This is not fun. And I just I determined at that point I was going to sell the boat and end the trip. But it wasn't so far gone to know that I could not return to Juneau. I could not return home because I just had this big going away party with lots of champagne. <laughs> and if I'd returned two days into my round the world cruise, <laughs> the humiliation would have been too much to bear. So I was going to sell her in Seattle. I'd put up with it to Seattle. And all the rest, the late afternoon, we just did these little tacks. And we're, we had no idea of our position. Little tacks, little tacks, trying to miss things. There were a lot of rocks and islands in Cross Sound. And then the sun went down, it went black. We saw nothing. So for an hour, Bob was on the tiller, then an hour I was on the tiller. All make it clear that I'm not that Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Who voted him into the Explorers Club? He's not that Bob. <laughs> and say around 2 or 3 o'clock in the, in the morning, still pitch black, the wind lays down, sea quiet, it quiets. And when the sun finally comes up, we're just nestled in this white, white cloud of fog. But if you look straight up at the sky, you could see blue sky. And there in the horizon, in the north, powering into the sky, 14,000 feet was Mount St. Elias. And we sat there in our little pool of blue for three or four hours. And then mid-morning, this little wind tiptoes down out of the northwest and plucks at canoe sails. And she gathers way, leaving bubbles in her wake. And as we head out into the gulf, Mount St. Elias reels back into the fog. It's the last sight I had in Alaska for many, many years. So I want to... Before I get too deeply in the story, I want to forestall a question right now. In fact, I've already been asked the question, totally inappropriately, before, before this talk started. And the question is, is why the hell would you do something like this? And, you know, I don't have a clue. The, I'm reminded of a book. This is an extraordinary book. It's called The White Nile by Alan Moorhead. And it's a book, it's a history of the exploration of the sources of the Nile. And those 19th century explorers, you have no idea the hell they put up with. I mean, the disease, the infections, the parasites, the dysenteries, the poisonous snakes, the heat. Half the time, those guys were delirious, being carried across the African savanna or the jungles by their porters. So Alan Moorhead takes this great stab at trying to explain why they would do this, or even more, why they would go back. And he's clueless. 
He's clueless. He's a little bit like a man trying to explain childbirth to a mother who's had 12 kids. And, <laughs> and, and it's the same with, like, you know, um, Hillary. You know, when you ask him why he climbed Everest, he says it because it's there. I mean, how, I've always thought that was really trite and very smug. But I realized that he probably didn't know either. I think one of my girlfriends came close to it. When we were breaking up, she said, you don't have enough oxytocin in your system. <laughs> and you know, oxytocin is, is the hugging hormone. It's the bonding hormone. <laughs> but the, the, story, the story that most resonates with me is the story that Bruce Chatwin told, tells in his book, The Song Lines, of a man who finds a wild swan. And he takes the swan backs and puts her in a cage. And for months and months, she's perfectly content to be in that cage. And then one day, it's time for her to go, to migrate. And she beats her breast bloody against the bars of the cage. She's inconsolable. She has to go. And he sets her free. The day, the very day that I learned you could sail a small boat across an ocean, it was like God leaned out of the clouds and whacked me with a two by four. I had no choice. No choice at all. I didn't stop and list the pros and cons. I didn't stop to consider what it was going to do to my future earning potential or my marriage prospects. I just had to go. <laughs> Two years later, I'm puking into the North Pacific and I have second thoughts, but that's a different story. This is the Bob. Good buddy, Bob Frampton. He's still in Alaska. So we went down the coast. Um, it was my intention to learn how to navigate. I, I refused to do any, any um, GPS, or at the time it was sat-nav. I had a sextant aboard, and all the manuals, and all the charts, and everything you needed to do to learn how to navigate by the stars. And of course, I was so nauseous, I couldn't read a thing. But it's hard to miss North America. At some point, you turn left, you're bound to run into it. We found Seattle. Bob left me, and I continued on down the coast. Now, I stopped in San Diego for a while to work. My, my intent was that if I had, 5, 000, if I had less than $5,000, I'd go east through the canal and work in Florida. If I had more than $5,000, I'd go west across the Pacific. So when it was time to leave, which was just in front of the hurricane season, I had $5,500, so I was headed west. And I continued on down the coast. Now, I need to say that when I was at sea, every day there de raged a debate in my head to go or not to go, to continue and putting up with the nausea, the cold, the wet, or to sell the boat and move back ashore. I had no idea when I was planning or thinking about this trip how difficult it is on your body to be moving constantly in a tiny boat, or the stress of long watches at sea, or the stress of going to sleep and not knowing what you would run into or what would run into you. And in truth, all the way down that coast, what was keeping me going was just inertia. I'd spent two years getting the money, buying the boat, putting it all together, two years, and it was that inertia. I didn't have the courage to say no to it, but I was no longer chasing a dream until I got all the way down to the southern tip of Mexico, and then things changed. So the next trip was southern tip of Mexico to Costa Rica. It was 500 miles. Good winds, five days, maybe six. It took me 19. <laughs> it was the most brutal, trip passage of the entire circumnavigation. No wind. Get offshore, <clears throat> sit there, bob in the sea, Kainui's sails just hanging on her like laundry. And then there'd be this storm, this storm that would just grow and grow and grow. The clouds would billow into the sky, high, tens of thousands of feet higher than you could imagine, higher than I thought clouds could get. And in that storm were thunder and lightning. And it wasn't like a stroke of lightning, and you get to count to five or ten, and then there'd be a distant rumble of thunder. The lightning was constantly, in fact, I got a picture, hang on. The picture, the lightning was constant, and you had this purple, at night, it was this violet purple, electric purple, and it was so constant I could work on deck without a flashlight. And the thunder, it was like a war zone. The explosions <coughs> were, were all around you and constantly, and the shockwaves were so great it would filibrate your eardrums. It was like somebody playing a snare drum on them. And that was the only wind I had, was in those storms. And they would only last 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and then they'd move on. So <clears throat> 15 minutes, 30 minutes, I get a mile, I get two miles. 
I had to put up my, my storm sails. If one of those storms caught me with all my fair weather light wind sails up, she'd they'd blow the boat over so the mass was almost in the water. And I'd crawl out on deck, you know, a vertical deck like this, and I'd throw myself on those sails to bring them down before they blew out. 5,500 miles, 19 days, that's about 26 miles a day. When I finally put an anchor in, say so anchored in a protected cove off the, in Costa Rica, and I got to shore, you know, the stress just kind of bled out of my body. And what filled in behind it was something I didn't expect, but I knew it instantly. I knew at that point that I was a sailor. Not that it was any good, not that I was a master, not that I knew what I was doing, but I knew then I was at home. I was at home at the sea. And at that point, there was no question but I was going on. So I worked for a long time. I worked for, on the boat for about six weeks in, in Costa Rica. I had a ton of work to do. And here I careened her on the beach like the old pirates did so I could work on her bottom. You know, it was a really dumb idea. <laughs> and then, and then w when I got the boat ready, headed down to Panama, this is a, boat, uh, a family. They, they lived on the island there. Um, they had a little farm. They came over to say hi. And then I sailed across the, the, the Straits of Panama towards Ecuador. And I need to tell you about one night. One night I come up, and it's a full moon, so it's all silvery. And there I look in the northwest. And then coming down out of the northwest are these beautiful, these little clouds that are shaped like muffins, flat on the bot, top, but flowery on top. And I knew exactly what they were, again, because I'd read all my books. And it's a particular type of, of cloud formation in the tropics. And they just march down out of the northwest, like a flanks of hoplites, you know, of Greek infantry. And the beauty, the silvery moon was so extraordinary. I brought my cushions up on that deck and I just watched them as they came by, just transfixed. Unable to, unable, you know, I thought a lot about this word and I couldn't think of it. Just beautiful. And then the stratus cloud came in and blotted them all away. I went to Ecuador because my brother-in-law and sister were in the Peace Corps there and they joined me. Well, I went up to Ec Guayaquil. Guayaquil is the largest city on the, um, on the littoral, on the coast, but you have to take this canal up. And of course, I run aground after going through the locks. I had to sit there for a couple hours for the tide to come in. But they joined me and they f we, we sailed out to the Galapagos together. This is Roque and he's got a mahi-mahi there. He was so excited. And if you've ever wondered why it's called the head, that's why. <laughs> Blue-footed boobies in... in um, in the Galapagos. And then they flew back to the mainland Ecuador and I wandered out. Um, this is one of my old charts. I wandered way out to uh, the westernmost island there. The, the L-shaped island is Isabel and the, and the other one is Ferrandina. And then one day, I raised anchor, came out from the lee, picked up the trades again and headed down to, headed to Pitcairn. So Pitcairn Island is the island where the mutineers on the bounty hid out from the British Admiralty in 1795. And Pitcairn Island was as far away from the Galapagos as Lubeck, Maine, easternmost Maine is from San Diego. It's a long trip. <laughs> and it was my first real ocean passage. And I'll tell you, I was worried. I was worried that I wouldn't find Pitcairn Island when I got there. All the way down from Cross Sound, from Alaska, all the way down to the Galapagos, I had never made a pinpoint land date. I never figured out that damn sextant and celestial navigation. And it's not a big deal when you're cruising along a continent, because you just come in, you're going to pick up the continent, <coughs> and you can run the shore down to wherever your destination is. But Pitcairn was one mile in diameter. Easy to miss. So we took off. It was November of 86, I think. And at that point, the trade winds are coming out of the south. So we headed west. I took the, the winds just after the beam out like that. And as we went west, the trade winds came, into the, came in out of the east and were able to shape, a, um, shape our course down to Pitcairn. Right. And the trades were powerful. They're the strongest trades I ever sailed in. Easily, almost full gale force, up into the 30 knots. And the waves were big, but in open sea, they kind of spread out. And Kainui could just lope over, lope over them. We had the frigate birds which are like central cast, out of, straight out of central casting for horror movies. You've got to see them. And albatross and pretty much the sea to ourselves. And every day I do a morning shot, a noon shot, and an afternoon shot. 
and then I'd fix our position. And I watched our position come down on the, on the chart towards Pitcairn, always wondering how far off I was. It is difficult to take a sunshine on a little boat that's heaving, bucking and heaving on a big sea. I'd come out on the deck and I'd have the sextant wrapped in my belly to protect it from salt spray and from, from uh, you know, if I stumbled from damage. And the, there are mirrors on the sextant that, that uh, reflect the sun or the, whatever body you're looking at in through a scope. And that boat's <clears throat> bucking and heaving like this and you try and get the sun in your scope and then you adjust the arm to bring the sun down to the horizon. Your, your goal is to have this, the lower edge, the lower limb of the sun. Just touch, just kiss that horizon. And of course, you're bucking and moving all around. It's hard to do. And on big waves, you know, the waves pick you up and it stretches the high horizon away. And then when the wave comes out from under you, you go down and the horizon comes back in. And you've got to know that distance to the horizon exactly or your calculations are wrong. And all the time, of course, you've got to have a death grip on that boat so you don't pitch overboard. So every day, every day I do that fix. And as we went south, we ran, I ran into another problem. And that problem was that I was passing underneath the sun. So I started out with the sun in the southern sky and I was going to end up with the sun in the northern sky. And when the sun's directly overhead, it's, it's worthless. It's pretty much worthless for, for celestial navigation. So you have to use the stars, the planets, or the moon. And if you think it's hard to find a sun in your little scope, finding a star, that little speck of light, which is buzzing around like a, like a, like a bumblebee on dexedrine, you <clears throat> it's hard. And not only that, when you find it, you're not even sure it's the right one because they all look the same. <laughs> and then you have to bring that dart down to this, you know, this, you know uh, it's a mess. And it, it's even worse because you only have 15 minutes at dawn and about 15 minutes at dusk to do this because it has to be light enough that you can see the horizon but not so light you lose the stars. And I had my, my, my manual, the navigation manual that I was using was one that's used by the Coast Guard Academy. And it says flat out there that, that star sights on a small boat are impossible and should not be attempted. <laughs> I, I had no choice. So, So about three weeks into the trip, we drop out of the trades. We're south of the Tropic of Capricorn and below the, the trade wind route. And at that point, lost the wind and the sky clouded up. Put up all my light sails and we just drifted along. By my reckoning, we were 110 miles away from Pitcairn Island. But I didn't have a clue whether that was the case. I mean, I didn't. And you know what? I forgot a really important point. Do you mind if I back up a little bit? All right. So here's the key, key thing for me on that trip down. I reread and reread those manuals, trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. I checked and rechecked my calculations, trying to figure out why my celestial navigation wasn't working. And by the way, I could never ask any other yachties, because they were all electronic. They were sat nav, which was the forerunner to the GPS. And then one day, I'm standing on the boat, and I'm thinking, and thinking this. And what I'm worried about is that, you know, if I get to uh, Pitcairn Island, where I expect it to be there, it's not there. And I was wondering how many days I would crisscross the sea looking for it. And my worry is if I couldn't find Pitcairn, which is hundreds of feet high, I'd never find the low-lying atolls of French Polynesia, which is where I was headed next. I mean, they're only a few feet off the water, then you've got, you know, a 30-foot or 40-foot coconut palm. And at one point, the sentence lit up in my brain. It's a sentence I probably read many times as I read through that chapter on celestial navigation. And it was this, that Coast Guard cadets are far more accurate with their sextant work after they've done 3,000 sites than when they've done 2,000 sites. Well, at that point, I hadn't done 500. I probably hadn't even done 300 sites. And what I realized that my problem wasn't with my calculations. It wasn't with my understanding of celestial navigation. It was that I hadn't mastered my instrument. I hadn't learned to become precise with the sextant. And that sentence just completely changed my attitude. Instead of like using the sextant like you use your butter knife, from at that point, it was like I had to develop a craft. I had to develop the precision or the relationship with the instrument so that I knew when it was a good sight, I knew when it was a poor sight. So then I dropped out of the trade wind belt. And 110 miles from Pitcairn Island, 
cloudy that first day, so I'm just dead reckoning, reckoning on, a, on a compass bearing. On the second day, it's cloudy, but right at noon, the sun burns through just a tiny little bit. You could look at it without sunglasses. And I took sight after sight out of that, that sun, knowing that it was too far overhead and too close together to be really accurate as a, um, to do a really accurate fix. So this here is a, this is a classic textbook, never found in nature plot, <laughs> right? So those three dark lines would be lines of position that, were, that would be generated off of a body, a celestial body, in three good different parts, angles in the sky, and that red X would be where you were. When I plotted, I plotted every one of those, <clears throat> those four, I think it was 14 sites that I took in 10 minutes when the sun was out. This is what I got. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. And, and for the life of me, I mean, that's, that's a total mess, right? And for the life of me, I can't, I don't know why I chose that spot, but right there, that's where I decided we were, right? That's Pitcairn, 20 miles away. We should, I should be able to see it. So I run up on deck, I run into the bow, and I'm leaning over the bow, and right in front of me is a squall, it's raining. And as I watch, it rains itself out, and then completely dissolves, and right behind it, dead ahead, is Pitcairn Island. There, there was some hooting and hollering on that boat. It still took me a day to close it. There she is. And you know, if I knew then that I was going to talk at the Explorers Club, I would have taken down the laundry. <laughs> but it took me another day because the winds were so light. They came out to get me. They took me, uh, took me uh, all around the island. And here I'm at the top of the island. That's Adamsville, where the central, uh, the village is. There were about 60 people on the island when I was there. I think it was 47, or somewhere 47, 50, were actually native Pitcairners, and the others were people that were staying for a time. And I, I need to explain the photograph, I know. Um, I'm not a photographer. I use the same roll of film from Ecuador to New Zealand, which was about a year in the tropics. And by the time I come to develop it, this, this end of the film had started to rot. Um, so only stay a day. There's no, there's no protected harbor on Pitcairn. And so I sailed away that evening after dinner. And I want to say, at that point, from that point on, I had no greater joy, no greater joy than walking to the front of the boat, leaning over the pulpit, at the time I knew, at the place I knew, and wait for Kainui to lift to a swell. And there on the distant horizon, See a little coconut frond pork pop right above the horizon. You know, another perfect landfall. And I also know that if I followed a GPS across that ocean, that joy wouldn't have been there. It would have been a fraction of what it was. And you know, there, I think there are times when we flatten our lives, when we take the craft out of them. So from Pitcairn Island up to French Polynesia, Polynesia across the South Pacific, and then down to New Zealand. Just some pictures here. So this is taken from the bow. Kainui is creaming through the water. Look at the rust stains. I mean, the sea is such a corrosive environment. I worked on her all the time. I don't know why all these laundry shots. <laughs> this is down below. And though I say I had no radio, my parents gave me that radio so I could call home if I were in trouble. I, I never got a license, and I, I never transmitted. I used it to pick up voice, you know, uh, voice of America, Willis Conover, Jazz Hour. I'd be out there blasting it to the albatross. <laughs> and by then I could read. I'd had the, I had the nausea pretty much under control, and I could read for an hour or two a day, but I spent hours and hours leaning against, that's the boom gallows right there behind that, below that belly button. Hours and hours leaning on that, just watching the, the horizon, watching her sail thinking and thinking. This is Bora Bora in the Society Islands. And I spent a long time, probably two months in French Polynesia because I was waiting out the hurricane season. And I would loop out. I'd do loops out and then come back to Tahiti. And I have only two regrets in this whole, this whole voyage. And the first regret happened in February. It must have been February of 87, 86, somewhere around there. 
I'm coming back in towards Tahiti after being out in the Tuamotos, out in the at atolls there. And it's late at night, and I pop my head out just for a standard look around. I was pretty good at waking up after a couple of hours. I stick my head out, check the sails, check the, check the compass bearing, and I didn't even bother putting on my glasses. And I look in the southern sky, right where the Magellanic clouds are, and I see this really bright star. And I knew the stars pretty well by then. I said, there's no star there. But who argues with the universe? If there's a star there, there's a star there. So I didn't put on my glasses. I didn't bring out my binoculars. I didn't check my star chart. Instead, I went down below and went back to sleep. So a few days later, I'm in Tahiti. And there on the picture, on the cover of Time magazine, is a picture of the first supernova that could be seen by the naked eye in four centuries. <laughs> and I didn't put on my bloody glasses. <laughs> so I, I was tired of waiting. I was the first boat out of Tahiti, out of French Polynesia, pushing the hurricane season. And this is in an atoll that six people living on it. And just a look how clear that water is. You can see I'm, I'm sailing down my anchor line to set it in the sand there. This is Atutaki and the Cook Islands. And those trade winds are relentless. This is the leeward side, the, the side away from the wind. But just look at those coconut palms. And this is me, and I'm showing this because look at that hair. God damn. <laughs> There's Kainui out in the lagoon. So Kainui is 25 feet long. She's teak hulled. She's made of tropical hardwood. She was made in 59, commissioned in 1960. And she was designed in the 30s by a British designer whose commission was to build a boat less than five tons that one person could sail offshore. Now at the time, no one did that. That was insane. Um, a skipper's lifespan was measured by his water line length. Kainui's water line length is 21 feet. So <clears throat> they're amazing boats. I mean, it's an old, old design. You, no one makes them like this anymore. But those boats have been all over the world, to the North Pole, to Antarctica, and Kainu is the fourth to sail around the world. This is Palmerston, also in, in the Cook Islands, and the locals here, the residents here, are selling fish to the fish buyer. You see anchored outside the reef. Um, they go back down to Roatonga, which is the, was where the tourist trade was. And this is Nui. So I'm just taking you across the South Pacific right now. And Nui um, is the largest coral island in the world. It was formed by two different uplifts. And just look at that. That coral was sharp as knives. And curiously, the harbor in Nui had these snakes, these sea snakes, which I never saw before or since. And I was told they were, they were the, the venom was, was fatal, but their heads were so small, it wasn't really risky. Those things would climb up my rubber, rudder post and get on the boat, and you'd have to be flicking them off. And this is Fiji. I, Fiji is, is really one of the most spectacular places in the South Pacific, and if you had one place to go, this is where I'd go. And I'm in the Yasawa group, which is in the, on the leeward side, on the, um, on the western side of, of the archipelago, and it stands in the rain shadow of the big island, which is Viti Levu. So it's really dry and sharp and clear there. And this sunset, as far as I could re recollect, is the first time I saw the sun actually set in the ocean and not in a wreath of clouds on the horizon. It was so dry there. So I need to explain this thing here. This is my wind vane. So a wind vane is designed to keep you sailing at the same angle as the wind, all right? So that if the wind changed, your bearing would change, your compass bearing would change. But by and large in the trades, that doesn't happen often. And for the historians among you, this is a Hassler. It w the wind vane was invented by, a, by a, a British seaman called Blondie Hassler. And I can say confidently, the technology has been much improved since then. <laughs> so here's some bad judgment. I, I didn't take down the sail when the wind was, was starting to breeze up and blew out the sail. This is on the south of Fiji and I had to have a new one made in New Zealand. So I left Fiji in, in August, which is winter, to go to New Zealand because, you know, I'm Alaskan, I had my skis aboard, and I was ready for some snow, hell, this tropical stuff. And um, New Zealand, of course, unfortunately, had the lightest snow year in its history, recorded history, when I got down there. But I spent a couple months in the South Island, and I came back up with some skiing buddies, and I taught them how to sail because I'd never seen Kainui sailing and not been on her. So I got out on the raft, and they sailed back and forth like, you know, they were on a perp walk there. And, and you can see my new Jenny. It's tan bark. 
Um, I chose red because I didn't want to be looking at a white canvas in the tropics and the sun. So it was in November then of 87 that I sailed up the east coast of New Zealand over the northern toe and across the Tasman Sea. Now the Tasman's a bumpy, bumpy sea. And by the time we were about two thirds of the way across it, we'd already weathered four gales. And in the morning after the fourth gale, you know, I cracked the, <coughs> crack the hatch and stick my head around, he head out. And the wind had moderated, but the seas were still big and they were, they were bumping and they were confused and they were bumping into Kainui from every different direction. She was lurching around like she was drunk. But the sky, the sky was pus colored with blisters and pustules and it, it, was, it was hideous, it was ugly and I just couldn't take it. So I slammed the hatch shut, went down below, go back to sleep and let Kainui suffer alone it alone. But within an hour, this wind rolled up from the southwest from the southern ocean. And relentlessly, it grew and grew in strength. And it clean, it swept the, the sky clean, so the sky was a molten blue. And the seas began to build, and the barometer started to drop. And by mid-morning, I knew I was going to be in for more than a gale. So I <clears throat> went up on deck, and I just stripped it. I take it, took a, everything off it that could be carried away or, or broken. I put the storm shutters on. And then I lashed, I took the, the mainsail off the, off the mast and lashed it to the boom. And then I put up the trisail. Trisail is tough as steel. It's a storm sail. And I'd never flown it since owning Kainui. And then with all my woolens on, my foul weather gear, I went back up on deck. I had my harness. I clipped into the boat. And I watched the storm grow. By 11 o'clock, it was blowing a full storm well over 50 knots. If I stood perpendicular to the wind, so I went across like this, the Venturi effect was so strong that I couldn't breathe up my leeward nostril. And, and, the, and the wind pushed the top two or three inches of, of seawater, like, um, just raced it across the top of the sea like a mountain brook. <clears throat> and it would slice off the top layer of water and, and vaporize it. And just for an instant, because the sky was clear and the sun was out, in that ball of vapor, there'd be a rainbow. You'd see a red or blue or a green. It would just flash, and then it would be destroyed. So everywhere you looked in these, in these high waves, you'd see these flashes of color like pixies dancing in the waves. As the waves picked up the boat, and we were fully exposed to the wind, that whole rig would just shake. And the wind just shrieked in the rigging. It was like a jet engine. And then when the wave passed under, and you slid back down into the trough, and you're in the lee of the next wave for one or two blessed seconds. It was like quiet. And then you were lifted back up into the storm. And when the waves got high, they started breaking. And when they broke on Kainui and landed on her deck, they sounded her like a drum. Just this big boom. And then tons of water would cascade down the decks. And I'd wrap myself around the boom so I wouldn't be carried away. And the only thing that would be sticking above the water would be the mast. And then every day, every hour or so, I'd drop down below and look at the barometer, wondering when it would start coming back up. But all afternoon, it dropped. And I stood there on the deck wondering, how big would it get? How strong the wind? How high the seas? And you might have asked me, you know, was I afraid? Was I scared? And you know what? I wasn't. And it's not because I'm courageous. I just don't think I'm wired that way. You know, we've got these fears. We get these fears of things that could cause us bodily injury, you know, that could hurt us or kill us. You know, like sailing into the North Pacific and not knowing how to sail, or walking, walking along the edge of a cliff, or somebody coming at you with a knife. But then there's whole other kind of fears, fears of things that can't hurt us, that can't maim us, that can't injure us. You know, the fear of looking foolish, the fear of hum humiliation, the fear of failure, the fear of looking weak, the fear of being dominated, the fear of opening your heart and telling somebody what's there. Those fears don't draw blood, but those are the fears that stop me. Those are the fears that narrow my life. At 6.30, the barometer ticked up, and I knew the low had passed. At 10 o'clock, it was a moonless night. It was black, so black. I was tired, I was cold, I was exhausted. I'd watched Kainui ride these seas for 12 hours. So I went below and went to sleep. At 10.30, we were hit. This wave picked up my little boat, 
turned her upside down, and threw her down into the sea. I was thrown up into the overhead. My nose went through a light fixture. There was blood everywhere. She immediately snapped back up on her feet, and I was catapulted into the bilges. The floorboards had been ripped out, and I froze there in the dark to feel her motion, to see if the rig was still on her, if the mast was still on. She was slow and stately, so I know it was, and I went back up on deck. I just watched the storm. I couldn't see anything. It was still black except these big, big waves. They'd rise up, and they just blotted out the stars in the lower part of the sky. Whatever had hit her had already passed. There was nothing I could do, so I went back down and cleaned up. She took a lot of damage. The worst was there was a compression crack in the deck, and her cabin top had been shifted over to the side. So any time she took waves on, on, which is like regularly, she took waves on that deck, the water streamed down below. But I, I could repair it. You know, As soon as I got, got to shore, it was something to prepare something I could repair. So we were hove to yet another day, 48 hours hove to, and on the third day set the sail and headed towards Australia. So I was headed to Melbourne in the south, like another picture here, not yet, don't look at that, um, <clears throat> in the southeast corner of the, of the country. Cruisers don't go down there. You know, it's out of the tropics, it's cold, and you have to go through that Tasman Sea. But I was going there searching for a man, a man named Brian Lowe. Brian had been born in Britain, and then after the war, he'd emigrated to Canada. And then in 1960, he built Kainui. And I'm the third owner. The second owner told me that all he knew about Brian Lowe was that Brian and his wife emigrated to Australia when they retired, and he thought they lived in Melbourne. So that's where I was headed. So as soon as I get to Melbourne, I drop the anchor. I go looking for a phone. I find his name in the phone book. I stick my quarters in, and I call him up. And he's very proper British. Brian Lowe speaking, and I say, my name is Russell Heath, I'm an American, and we have a friend in common. Oh, who might that be? Her name's Kainui, and there's this long, long pause. <laughs> and from far, far away, he says, I built her, you know. And I said, yeah, I know, and she's here in Melbourne. So Brian, I mean, not a beautiful boat, 25 foot. And Liz became my friends. <clears throat> and months later, when we were back up, when Kainui and I were back up in the tropics, back up <clears throat> in the warmth, Brian and Liz came and sailed on her one last time in the Coral Sea. So Brian Lowe's birthday is September 13th, 1913. Last month, he was 102. And the modern world is wondrous. He's watching us right now. <laughs> Oi, Brian, thank you so much for Kanui. So I worked in Melbourne six months, and then in the middle of winter in June, lessons are never learned, I sailed back up through the Tasman Sea and back up into the, into the warmth. And <clears throat> Kanui, we needed a major mit, mis, uh, refit. She'd been hard used. And I replaced the rigging, I checked the keel bolts, and then one day I was casually knocking the rust off my chain plates. And the chain plates are the anchors that anchor the shrouds, or the wires that support the mast. And without any effort at all, or even intending to, I knocked a hole right through one, which was pretty sobering. Um, so I had to, I had to um, replace those as well. And I need to say, you know, there's that proverb that a rolling stone gathers no moss, and I'm, I'm somewhat of a rolling stone, and I have damn little moss. And in fact, almost everything that I own can be stuck in the back of a Honda Civic, and, and I know that because I've gone back and forth across the country with everything I own in a Honda Civic. <laughs> and I love that boat. I love that boat in a way. <clears throat> I've never loved a thing before. And there's no joy like pulling out the paintbrush or pulling out the tools and I had this big box of bronze screws I just love that box of bronze screws so I loved working on her and I want to say something else here too and that is there's no way you can stay around the world by yourself I can't tell you how many people help me and I want to give you an example when I left San Diego right I didn't have a clue I didn't have the faintest idea of the procedure, I didn't even ask the question, of the procedure of taking a boat from one country to the next, what documents you needed, what kind you had to go through. I just show up in some Mexican city, hey, here I am. 
with a passport. And the Mexican authorities, there were three men that day. They just look at me. And you understand that aside from burrito, I don't speak a word of Spanish. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and they spent the whole morning running all around that town getting the documents I needed, the Department of Agriculture, you know, the, 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 the immigration, the, the customs, and the harbor master. And, and by noon, they had this whole stack of papers that I didn't know I needed. Those men tended me with as much care as my mother. And it was that way all, everywhere. <laughs> I may not be able to pronounce their names, certainly not speak their language, people I'd never see again. They took me into their homes, into their families. And I was just profoundly touched and grateful. It, would have been a lot, it wouldn't have happened otherwise. And this, this is a really long story. And all I can say is, that's Jan in the upper left corner. These are two girls, Amanda and Chelsea. And they brought a lot of light into my life in Australia and subsequently. Chelsea is due October 22nd here in New York. So up over the, coast of, uh, the top of, um, of Australia. This is an East Timor Sea, a following, a following breeze. And they went across the Indian Ocean and up to Sri Lanka. And here's Bob, again. God, he's handsome. Doesn't it drive you nuts? And <clears throat> I needed his help to get the boat up the Red Sea. And there's a cart. They wouldn't let us bring a truck or a taxi into the, into the harbor, but that's all of our food for the next couple, couple months. <laughs> there's not much food on the atolls. There's not much food on the islands. So here in Sri Lanka, there was lots and lots of food. And Sri Lanka at the time was in this great national tragedy. There was the fight, the, 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 the war of the Tamil Tigers in the north, but the radical Sinhalese, which were upset about what was happening in the north, had lost it in the south. And at night, we'd hear automatic weapon fire, and there's a lot of things that we couldn't get. These men were fishermen. They'd wake us up at the crack of dawn every morning. They'd throw out a purse seine into the harbor, a net <clears throat> that had weights on the end of it. And when they brought it back in, they would clap it against the side of the hall. It was, it was just this glorious sound. I, I can't think of a better thing to wake up to. But the fish they caught were like this. They wouldn't feed your cat. I don't know how they survived. <laughs> so from Sri Lanka, they're off the coast of India. We went down to the Maldives, across the Arabian Sea, and up the Red Sea. This is in the Maldives. The Maldives is this glorious archipelago off the southwest coast of India. And this is in Mali, which is the capital and the largest largest island in, in, the, um, in the archipelago. And here's the waterfront. All those boats come in from the outlying islands to trade. And here, when we were up there and <clears throat> cruising through the atolls, we anchored off a village and the boys came out to say hi. I need to say, these are not my photographs. These are bombs. Um, and not this bomb. And this is, this is the headman's wife. She, she took 15 seconds to compose herself. And then across up the Arabian Sea, and this is the Saudi Peninsula. We're coming into South Yemen. South Yemen at the time was the only Marxist uh, Arab country. And this is a Soviet freighter there. If you look closely, you'll see a hammer and sickle on the stack. This is our contact with the black market. If you're good, you always find that contact first off. We'd sell them dollars for a Yemeni currency. And then across the Gulf of Aden <clears throat> to Djibouti, which has this extraordinarily deep water port. There are not many on the east side of Africa. And this is an old Arab dhow. The sailing rig's been taken off. There's a big diesel in her. And she's running beef cattle over, over to Saudi Arabia. You did not want to be downwind. <laughs> then we're up the Red Sea. And, and the Red Sea is, is, is a difficult difficult passage because the wind's out of the northwest, so you're tacking up, up, up. And there's short tacks. And on one side, of course, you had Eritrea fighting with Ethiopia. On the other side, you had Saudi Arabia that tended to take your yacht if you strayed in too close to shore. But the worst thing was that you had freighters coming down and going up to the Suez Canal all day. And I needed Bob to have a 24-hour watch. I just didn't think it was safe. I know that's a funny thing for me to say, but to... <clears throat> to not have a 24-hour watch as we went up, up the sea. Bob left me when we reached Egypt. And here we are, here's Kainui and I in the Suez Canal. And the, the Suez Canal Authority did not want us to go in the, in the, through the canal. She's powered by an outboard, and they said it wasn't safe, and they've never had an outboard through the, through the Suez Canal, and so you're not going through. 
So I hired a, a shipping agent and said, how much is it going to cost me to change the canal authority's mind? Well, it was $20. <laughs> and I got through, and here's the irony. Ten miles south of the Mediterranean, Port Said in the Mediterranean, grease and grime, which is my outboard, lost compression in her, one of her two cylinders. And we went from six knots to three quarters of a knot. And so we were in the, so it took us another 10 hours to get up into Port Sage. So we were in the canal after hours, which is like a major no-no. And there are a lot of people upset. But I was upset because I didn't want to prove the canal authority right that it wasn't safe to take an outboard. But in any case, I was in the Mediterranean era. They could get themselves upset. I wasn't terribly worried. So through the Mediterranean and then down around through the, across the Atlantic, next to the run down to Costa Rica, the passage through the Mediterranean was most difficult. It was February, March, terribly cold, terribly cold. The winds were out of the northwest. I'd be hit by a gale and I'd be blown backwards and I'd lose two days of, of forward progress. But the worst thing was the traffic, the shipping traffic. You know, at sea, you have defined shipping lanes. Here you did not. There was freighters coming every which way, cross countries. You had the fishing boats, you had ferries, private boats. And all through the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, when I needed to, I could awake to an alarm. I, would <clears throat> I could sleep for 15 minutes, the alarm would wake me up, I'd stick my head out the hatch, make sure all was well, go down, sip, sleep another 15 minutes. In the Mediterranean, I'd started sleeping through my, through my alarm. There was nothing I could do. When we got to Italy, I bought the loudest kitchen timer I could, I slept through that as well. The only way that I could stay safe was to stay up all night. So night after night after night, I stayed up. And by the time I got to the Straits of Gibraltar and I headed back out into the North Atlantic, and we got there late afternoon, it was almost dusk, and I could see boats coming up from the south and boats coming in from the west and boats coming down from the north, all headed for the Straits, all headed for us, and we were headed out. And at that time, I was so exhausted, I was so tired, I said, that's it, I don't care. And I flipped on her running lights, and I went down below and went to sleep. And Kainui just sailed blindly into the Atlantic. <laughs> you know, it was rough. I mean, there's some times, it's just extraordinary. And I understand why, you know, people just give up at times and die. So, the sailing directions for a westward crossing of the Atlantic are simple. You sail south until the butter melts. You turn right. So we left Madeira, a Portuguese island off the west coast of Africa, in late May, 1989. And as we sailed out, as we took in the mooring lines and put up the sail and we started drifting around, there were all these people up in the quay just waving us at us and saying goodbye. And these were people that had just stepped out of the Mediterranean, were just starting their trips around the world or across the Atlantic, wherever they're going. And <clears throat> in my three days in Madeira, they had just pounded me with questions. How do you anchor in, a co in coral? How do you heave to it before a gale? How do you stay awake in the long nighttime watches? And we were the salts. I was the old salt at that time because I could answer the questions and I could tell them stories. So we waved goodbye. We sailed south until we were nestled again in the eastward trade, turned westward and headed across. And those first couple weeks were just glorious. The sky was sky, sky blue. <clears throat> the winds were easy, and Kainui just slipped through the, through the waves, pulled by her spinnaker. And then two weeks into the passage, we lost the wind. And day after windless day, we bobbed on the sea. And I was worried. I mean, I get worried every once in a while. And I was worried that we were in the hurricane season. It had already started. And I set this date. June 15th, if we didn't get wind by June 15th, when we did, I would sail south towards the equator to get out of the hurricane belt, and then <clears throat> sail to South America and winter over in South America, coming north the next spring. We were headed, by the way, to Bar Harbor, Bar Harbor, Maine. It was going to be our last ocean crossing and our longest. It was 4,300 miles. And Two months before, when we'd stopped in Italy, I'd bought a book. In some crazy fit of self-improvement, I bought a text called Introduction to Poetry. <laughs> and it was a big buy for me, because I was pretty much out of money. And I didn't have enough books to get us all the way home. 
So I instantly regretted it because, you know, Tom Clancy would have done so much better for me. <laughs> so I was halfway across the Atlantic before I drug it up on deck and I started poking into it. And we read the chapter on meter and then the chapter on rhyme and the chapter on metaphor. Those poems kind of came out of the mist. They started making sense to me. And what I found is that they, they, they amplified, they gave voice to the feelings that were churning in inside me. You know, the feelings about going home after being gone for four years, about sailing around the globe, about night after night under starry skies standing watch. And when the sun <clears throat> got in, you know, in the afternoon when the sun was in the western sky, I would go forward and sit leaning against my mast in the shade of the spinnaker and I'd memorize poems. And then... In the evening, when the winds were a little lighter and the colors a little richer, I would sit right on the pulpit, the very bow of the boat, like a figurehead. So Kainui was entirely behind me. I couldn't see her at all. All I could see was the sky, the sea, and the line where they met. And I would recite those poems. I just belt them out to the gulls and the flying fish that Kainui flushed from the sea. I will rise and go now and go to Innis free. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. And my favorite, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. Day after day, I sit on that pulpit and I recite those poems. And it raised goosebumps on my hand, on my arms, <clears throat> and tears in my eyes. In the round of a journey, from when you step over your threshold to and return to it. It is in the departure and the return that life most lives in you. It's when you're most exposed to the workings of your soul. In the departure, it is the call to adventure, the call to challenge. It's the tang of danger of the unknown. And it's the excitement of launching a dream long nurtured. In the return, it's the melancholy of something epic ending, the longing for hearth and home, the embrace of friends and family, and the uncertainty about not knowing what was coming next. And then, <clears throat> on June 28th, we crossed the Gulf Stream, and I trailed my hand in the water trying to feel the difference in temperature. I couldn't feel a thing. A few days after that, we came up on George's Bank off of the coast of Massachusetts, and the air and the sky clouded up, and the air was misty and thick with the scent of mud flats, and this big flock of herring gull landed in front of us. As we ghosted through, just, we just had really light airs. They parted and made a passageway for us, as sharp and true and straight as if it had been marked off by a rule. And then those birds that fell behind, 30, 40 yards, they flew up and landed in front of us again, on the water, only to part as we glided through. Again and again they did that, escorting us, escorting us home. And I found a poem, a line in, in a poem by T.S. Eliot. To make an end is to make a beginning. And standing on that deck, closing the coast of Maine, I decided on a beginning, my next beginning, I decided to step off my path of wandering. So my second time around the world, there have been tons of trips in between. I would step off that path of wandering and onto the path of connection and community. I would marry. I'd find a job that I love, that made a contribution. And I would build with my own hands a home. That would be my new beginning. That would be my beginning when I got home. You know, it was a dive into domesticity. It was a path that millions and millions and millions of people travel every day. But it was new to me. I was excited. I was looking forward to it, looking forward to get started. And it never occurred to me, as I stood on that deck and I watched Kainui dance in the waves, that I'd never make it happen. In the end, I think wandering is part of my soul, and like that swan who beat her breast bloody on the bars of her cage, it wasn't something I could say no to. On her 51st day at sea, I raised a spectral outline in Mount Cadillac on the coast of Maine. 
And all day we close it, and by late afternoon, fog comes down on us. And I quickly take, before we're fog bound, I take bearings on Egg Rock and bearings on Cranberry Islands. And then blindly we follow that, bear, that bearing in. The sun goes down, the fog turns gray and dusky. But just as we enter Frenchman's Bay, we pull out of the fog bank. And the sky above us is cloudless, and it's a deep, deep burgundy, and it's dusted with a thousand silver stars, and hanging in the western sky, diamond bright is Venus. And we sail up the, the bay, we come around Bar, Harbor, Bar Island, and round up into the gentle breeze, and at 10.20, July 3rd, 1989, I let go of the anchor, and set it in good, rich American mud. We were home. There she is. She's leaning against our dock in the coast of Maine. I'm done. Hard to beat that. Matter.